Hi. Hi, Judith. Hi, Jess. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm good, thank you. We are here tonight. Um, my name is Jess Martin, and I am the MAG Curator in Charge um, and the Curator of American Art, and I am welcoming Judith Schechter, stained glass artist, um, to an online conversation. Um, I um, was so sad to see the exhibition close when MAG closed. Um, the exhibition opened on February 15th. It um, closed when the museum closed due to the COVID-19 pandemic on in mid-March. Um, so we were able to enjoy the exhibition for about a month. We had um, a wonderful opening weekend. Judith, you gave a lecture that was fabulous. And I'm sure you remember, it was so well attended, we had to send people away. Um, and we also um, had it put online. So if anybody wants to see that, that is now on our um, webpage. Judith, what was your experience like that weekend, um, uh, giving a lecture where we were sending people away and, and walking through and being celebrated in that way? How was, how was that experience for you? Well, first I just wanna say hello and hello to anyone watching. Thank you for coming and being here. Um, and thank you, Chess and Mag, for hosting this event. I really appreciate it. The, the pre-pandemic experience of the exhibition was, it was quite something. I mean, the exhibition was in the planning for two years. And <clears throat> I was so excited about it that I think I came across as a um, as frozen. I didn't want to jinx anything. I was thrilled about it and I couldn't wait. I didn't, you know, I kept on thinking like, oh, please let me live those two years so that I could just go to the opening. I was really excited about it and the opening was amazing. Um, it was, it was, I said this then, I don't know how I thought of it, but I, it was the most validating moment of my career. Yeah. It was really fun um, and Seeing, I, I saw the exhibition before the museum opened it to the public, so I got to go in. First of all, my airplane was late, and I thought, I'll never get there. Um, but then I saw the exhibition, and it was, uh, it was an out-of-body experience. I, I, it, it didn't seem like I made the work. I didn't, uh, it was very strange in a very, very positive way. It was, a, it was an amazing experience. And, um, Mag had some great wine and cheese. It was a great weekend. I'm gonna start scrolling through the images if, if that's okay. Um, we, because the exhibition closed on uh, in the museum, um, we uh, ended up putting everything online. So um, I hope that folks who didn't have a chance to see the show um, will have an opportunity to view the exhibition online, all of the images, all of the content, everything is um, available to be seen on MAG's website, um, along with a link to Judith's lecture. And um, so that's, you know, one of the ways in which we really tried to um, accommodate the fact that it's now closed. And, and Judith, you said two years, but the first time that I came to visit you um, was in 2016. So um, from on our end, we've been, you know, really working towards this for, for many years. Um, so as I said, we were able to put everything online, which, which is really helpful. Um, but what we, what we wanted to kind of announce with this conversation tonight is that we actually have a wonderful opportunity. The show was supposed to close on May 24th um, at MAG and then move on to the next venue, which is the Toledo Museum of Art. But we were really excited that um, our colleagues at Toledo have, have worked really um, with us to uh, extend the exhibition in Rochester. So it'll be um, at MAG through the summer um, and into September. So, um, so we hope that we'll have an opportunity to welcome um, a lot more visitors in to see um, this exhibition. I hope that the, the that's um, suitable, you know, but I don't know how uh, it's going to go this summer with the pandemic. I guess we'll, we'll find out. Everything is so unknown. I think that's one of the things we've really had to kind of embrace. Um, and just what, just the opportunity to even extend the exhibition, what, what that might look like when we open and how we'll make um, accommodations for social distancing is, is something that we, we are working um, towards right now at the museum. So, um, uh, that's really a priority for us. Um, 
before I went any further, I did want to also say that um, we are welcoming your questions tonight. So I have some questions that I'm going to ask Judith because um, I never tire of, of having conversation with you, Judith. Um, but I, this is a great opportunity. I'm um, having this online um, conversation to welcome um, folks to ask questions because I know that I know that there are a lot. Um, and I hear my dog scratching at the door. So if you hear anything suspicious, that's that's what it is. Um, so I'll continue to sort of scroll through these images. Um, Judith, I also I was mentioning um, having the online uh, conversation. I wanted to uh, invite you to explain what what sort of brought us here to this um, event tonight. Your your very generous offer to do this event. This was not on the books, um, but you reached out to us and and offered to do it. Well, when you contacted me, I think you emailed me to say that the museum was closed. I think it was March 14th or something like that. I thought to myself, yes, it's 5 p.m. It's closed. I, it took a couple of days for it to sink in that, oh my God, she meant closed, 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 all the way closed for a really long time. Yeah. And it was, you know, this is, the pandemic has affected a lot of artists. A lot of people had shows and a lot of people had plans and uh, they had to change their plans. So I was devastated. I also felt really guilty for feeling devastated because I felt like it was a luxury problem. Um, but the grief was real. And um, eventually I thought I should think of something constructive to do. I'm a teacher and I had to migrate my classes online really fast. And I didn't, I never Zoomed before, but I thought maybe we could, we could do some sort of event. So I just offered. <clears throat> yeah, I, I was um, feeling very much the same way, like really terribly devastated that the show was closed, but also not really feeling like it was an appropriate response necessarily because of how much else was going on in the world. Um, and so it was really helpful to hear from you, to have you say, um, you know, I'm feeling like there's something that I want to be able to contribute. I want to be able to do something to, you know, what are the ways in which I can be um, helpful? And so, so that was actually really helpful to me. Um, and thank you for giving this opportunity for our, for our um, audience uh, tonight. Um, I was going to, I feel like um, museums can help us in this sort of crazy moment that we're in right now to sort of set ourselves within the context of history and um, and that's so important. But I also feel like museums have this um, responsibility at, at a moment like, like we're in right now to give living artists a platform um, to share their thinking and their, their vision and their understanding of the world. Um, well, Jess, I wanted to ask you a question, um, which was, I, you were so fantastic to work with during the planning of the show. And I've had plenty of <clears throat> exhibitions in my life. And this was unusual. And I just um, wondered, you know, a lot of times curators are working with dead artists. So um, did you have a, an experience, uh, experience that was different with a live artist? Well, I, I think that, um, yeah, it's, it's a very different experience. It was for me. Um, I loved working with you. I, I think that um, I, all along, I've been surprised at how, um, you know, just sort of open you've been, really trusting. Um, and not everybody would feel that comfortable. You didn't know me until we got to know each other, you know, and so it's a big responsibility to basically put your your career in somebody else's hands. So I feel like that was a big um, first step was for us to get to know each other and, and to develop the trust. But I think all along your input has been so invaluable. And, and even when, you know, I would send along an idea for a checklist, the initial checklist, and you would say, well, you know, I'd really like for you to include this piece, or, you know, maybe the piece that you have here is not the best example. And so all of that feedback I felt like was a really um, fun, collaborative, um, and creative uh, experience. Um, one detail that I'll say, and it's helpful that we're looking at these images right now of the installation, we initially um, proposed darker walls for the exhibition space. 
and we sent you along a proposal for that, how that would look. And you were so like, you were so great and clear. Do you remember your response? Please don't put my work on dark walls. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. I, uh, <clears throat> I once had an experience when I was really young. I, I used to show at a cooperative gallery and I painted all the walls black. <clears throat> and it, I'll never do that again. It was, it just killed the, the energy in the room. It was really um, toxic. So I, I think they need to be a, a sort of a neutral color. And I just want to say, um, in terms of being part of the planning process, I really had to let go of my ego. Part of me just wanted to interfere all the time. And it was, it, was a, it, was, um, it was a test of my uh, ability to, <laughs> to, to back off. Well, I thought, I really felt like you, you were, um, you would chime in and, and when you did, it was always, I always knew that you really meant it and it was something important. Um, so I think that, you know, what we ended up with that this wall color really is, is a, a beautiful example of how that kind of collaboration was so fruitful um, and something that I really enjoyed. You didn't tell me you were going to put those quotes on the wall. I didn't tell you that. <laughs> well, actually, me. I didn't <laughs> remember. I don't think so, but it's good that you didn't because um, you would have I, said no. I think I would have. No, I, I, I'm sure I remember saying at least some of them. I think, well, you've definitely said all of them. <laughs> I'm sure of it. But, um, but I really felt like it, throughout the exhibition space, it was important to me that, that the audience not only see your work, but that they also hear your voice. So, because no one can talk about you and your work, I think better than you do. Um, and your voice and, and the way that you talk about your work is so singular and, and so clear and it's so, so distinctive that I wanted that to kind of be infusing people as they were in the space. So not only did I include your quotes because I feel like you know I can write about your work and that's a certain perspective and I think I can bring something to it but I wanted people to hear what you said about what's important to you. And then also we have the video playing in the space so that people could hear the kind of interviews with you and, and you talking about your work as well. I wanted that to kind of be, you know, sort of everywhere when you walked. Well, that part was just frightening <laughs> for, for me. Oh, the video. <laughs> yeah. Here I am yeah. really big talking. I can't bear the sound of my own voice in recording. Same, really, really totally the same. Self-conscious. Yeah. So I, I wanted to sort of leading from this idea of living in this kind of extraordinary moment that we are living in. Um, I wanted to read a passage from Glenn Adamson, the great sort of craft uh, scholar and thinker wrote the introduction for the catalog for this exhibition, which was, which was really a wonderful, um, a wonderful thing. And so, you know, kind of thinking about um, living in the midst of a pandemic and how everything seems upside down and reality is kind of gone a little bit less familiar than it normally is. Um, I wanted to read this, this quote, this passage that he wrote um, and, and get your response. Um, Schechter's comic grotesqueries down in the mucky wells of human experience are infused with a degree of heavenly grace. When she chooses themes that are less carnivalesque and more straightforwardly tragic, this effect becomes all the more resonant. She does not turn her eyes away from the very worst of human nature. Schechter must be the only stained glass artist in history whose work warrants trigger warnings. And yet this dream world, like the one we all experience nightly, has its moments of bliss as well as its nightmares. You know, it's kind of hard for me to respond to that because I, it's, um, it's a really lovely thing to say and I just want to bask in it. <laughs> I, I think weird picky thoughts, like what, um, when did I do anything all that tragic? That seems a little disingenuous because I think there are plenty of examples. Um, but um, and the trigger warning thing is really funny. I, I hope that they, I know that the pieces upset some people sometimes because I get that feedback, not usually directly, but I find out 
And every now and then, when you're an artist, you can overhear what people are saying about your work and they don't know you're the artist. That's, uh, that's really raw. Um, so um, I, I, I just think about that comment and I, I, I wonder if that's really true. It's, it's strange to me to hear um, writing about my work. It, I, get, I think that I sort of go into a self-conscious uh, state of uh, where my brain turns off a little mm -hmm. bit. But I mean, I love it. I hope it's all true. <clears throat> I think that I would love for um, us to start to receive maybe some of the questions that folks are folks are asking. Um, I'll continue with my my questions for for Judith. I you mentioned um, the quotes on the walls, and one of the the quotes um, is that one of the highest ideals of humankind is to love what is loathsome. And I wonder if maybe I could ask you to. I mean, I feel like. Uh, that really encapsulates a lot in terms of your subject matter and your um, empathy, which I feel like is maybe one of the most, uh, the strongest elements of, of you as an artist that, that I'm drawn to is your empathy. Um, so I wonder if you might speak a little bit about that quote. Um, well, I think it's pretty easy to love what's lovable. So what, you know, when I think about what art is uh, in some sort of fundamental definition, uh, I think one of the things it can do is, is be a, a venue for experiencing things that we might not be able to experience in real life because they're too terrifying, too awful, too upsetting. And knowing that the artwork is essentially fake, it's a picture, it makes it safe to sort of consider these things. So if we can understand what we find loathsome, we, we usually find that it, it reflects on ourselves and that it's something about ourselves that we find intolerable and that we maybe, um, I know I've done this, projected on other people. And, uh, <clears throat> and so I think artwork is a way to, to address that issue. Um, I don't think, I think when talking about the very definition of art, people get into trouble really fast. But I will say, I've always been really interested in what art is in a, a universal sense. Like, why is it that we can relate to the images that were on the cave walls from 40,000 years ago so immediately? Um, mm -hmm. And as an artist, I, I hope to make images that would um, be understandable to all people. People do, I think, have um, a sort of a disconnect between the subject matter and the way I represent it, so that the subject matter can be um, maybe difficult, but the picture itself is pretty, so there's a little bit of a confusion. Um, there's a question from the audience on, uh, mm -hmm. that I can read that gets to this as well. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> So, uh, some people, I have said that some in interviews that some people find my artworks tortured or sad, but, um, but it isn't the case for me. That is true. Um, despite being personal to each individual, does the definition of beautiful, um, should it be somehow theorized in a way that can be taught to art students and viewers in order to bring them a better reading when seeing the artworks? Uh, and not stop at a possible negative first impression. I've always been interested in, in the definition of beautiful. I think that's the sort of part of the standard lecture that I always give. And, um, and like I just said, I think that there can be a real um, sort of cognitive dissonance between what the image looks like and what the subject matter is. So I think De defining beauty is as uh, hard and uh, challenging as it is uh, to define art, but I am more than willing to go there, and I do when I teach. However, I'm totally fine with people disagreeing with me. <clears throat> um, so one of the things I think about beauty is that Contemporary art, like ever since, say, World War I, so modern art from 
maybe even the uh, Impressionists on, was uh, not interested in aesthetics. And so there's been a move to um, get rid of that. And, and sometimes I think it comes back. Like, for example, I noticed with the pandemic that we went from being very angry about politics to being feeling a lot of despair. And people seem to respond on social media to beautiful images, like, you know, drowning people in a piece of driftwood, <laughs> something like that. That's a little simplistic, but um, just a sort of casual observation. Sure, I understand. I, th I feel like people are thirsty for it. Yeah, something soothing. Mm -hmm. or something that c makes their suffering meaningful rather than just a um you know like uh, uh whatever's going on is a senseless joke being played at our expense yeah. you know to know that if you shelter in place it does good is uh is helpful rather than just we're doing it because yeah so yeah, I think when we were when we were having a conversation earlier, um, I was saying that I think that um, folks expect a lot from artists in this moment. You you said that as well. You feel like there's a lot of pressure on artists to how are you responding? You know, what are you doing? What are you making right now? Um, because people are looking to artists to help them make sense of the world. Um, but I am interested and I'm, I'm certain that other folks are too in hearing what your experience has been like, your creative experience in the last couple months. Well, um, the first thing I will say is the idea that uh, artists and introverts get suddenly more creative in a, in a pandemic is patently false, if I'm any indication. Uh, the first, <laughs> I, I didn't feel motivated, productive, uh, or at all at first. It was uh, traumatizing uh, and upsetting. I spent far too much time watching the news. Yeah. And uh, I didn't feel creative at all. And as time has gone by, I've, I've become more adjusted to, to this uh, new reality. And so it's become easier to work. Mm. But at first it was not. I also felt like um, someone, a, a, a friend of mine posted on Facebook, like apropos of all of this, how does art give us hope? And I thought that was a really interesting question. A lot of the people sort of addressed it by saying art gives us hope because it's uplifting. And uh, that's to me, um, yes, I agree. It can be, it can also not be uplifting. It could also not be hopeful, which someone said too, which was pretty funny. But um, I was interested in the mechanism. How is it that this art thing actually can give hope? Because I don't go in my studio and think I'm gonna like boil up a bunch of hope for people, you know? Um, and I think a lot of times when people talk about art or artists talk about art, they talk about how it communicates. And I see, I can see that art communicates, but so does language. And uh, language is pretty efficient at communication, relatively speaking. And I think that art communicates differently. It's not communication like talking. It's more a case of um, echolocation or even, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm not, I don't, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Telepathy. I don't believe in telepathy, but it's like telepathy. And, and so, just feeling the um, sense of inspiration that maybe the artist felt makes a sense of connection. Right. And uh, um, I think that when we feel connected to each other, we feel uh, hopeful. When we feel disconnected, conversely, we feel uh, pretty not hopeful. Right. So in, in that way, and one of the things, as I was saying before about ancient art, it, it doesn't matter when it happened in time. You can look at paintings from uh, 20 uh, years ago, 20, a thousand years ago, and it, sometimes they're just speaking to you right this second. Mm -hmm. And I, that to me is pretty amazing faculty of art. And I think it's fundamentally helpful. 
um, even if you don't like to be um, hugging people all the time or whatever, if you're an introvert. So it works for introverts too. <laughs> right. Um, we have another question from the audience. Um, would love to hear some of uh, the other glass and media artists that Judith finds inspiring who are creating art to this day. Um, wow. Whenever I get that question, I immediately go into brain freeze. <laughs> um, I once did a 20 page document of all the people whose uh, all the art that I found inspiring and I didn't put commas in it. It was just tightly spaced with all the stuff. Um, the question specifically states now, which is interesting because actually um, my preference is for art that is not now. I have a, a really strong preference for ancient art and um, art by people whose name is Anonymous. So um, Anonymous is my favorite artist. Anonymous did a lot of work. Um, I went to, I, I went to a, a exhibition at the Metropolitan a couple years ago to see Balthus, the painter mm -hmm. Balthus. I like Balthus. And, um, I saw the exhibition and it kind of left me cold. And then I wandered into another room, which was the history of international trade as seen through textiles. And I was like, oh, this stuff is amazing. <laughs> uh, I, I couldn't get enough of it. And it was all textiles. It was a, a huge survey of international trade from you know, the Silk Road on. Mm -hmm. It was a terrific show. So I tend to like uh, anonymous artists. I do have a preference for craft artists um, mm. a lot of the times or things that are utilitarian, even though my stained glass windows are not really all that utilitarian. They might block the rain. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you should try it. Um, so, um, it would take me a while to come up a, 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 of a list of contemporary artists. Um, but well, I, I think that, I mean, I've definitely seen you respond to this question before. Um, and, and I would just point out to, to folks who are listening right now that Judith's, you know, Facebook page, website, blog, um, you're prolific on social media. You really have lots of content um, out there. and I. I know that you've spoken specifically not only about you know historical artists that that have inspired you but but also contemporary artists too and you might even have answered that question in um in the exhibition catalog that we published i feel like there might be something about that in there too um let's see so i'm wondering if we have any uh, more questions from the audience i'll keep my eyes peeled for that and in the meantime, what I'm doing here is we're just sort of scrolling through um, the uh, checklist for the exhibition. So uh, just to sort of say that the show, um, the earliest piece in the show is from 1983. And the most recent piece is from 2018. Um, so that really is the span of your, of your career. And there's about 45 um, pieces in the show. And so what I'm doing right now is where, as we're talking is I'm sort of scrolling through in chronological order, um, the checklist for the exhibition. So you got to see a lot of old friends, right? When you came to the exhibition opening, Judith, and, and you were able to see all the work on view. Yeah, it, it's funny. I've made, um, I keep records kind of compulsively. So I think I've made 233 windows and there's 43 in the exhibition. So what's that, like one fifth? That is way too much math for me. Yeah, it's beyond my ability as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you, um, if I was so worried that like someone would be missing, like some of the pieces, um, but when I actually saw the show, like I said, it was an out of body experience. It was almost like I didn't, realized that I had made the work myself. Um, so I, um, I didn't even, I didn't recognize them in a way. I didn't I recognize, would recognize them in my studio better than on the wall of a museum. Right. 
And uh, it was great to see some of them. Sometimes when I make work, I, um, I don't like it. And then years later when I see it, I have no idea why I had a problem with it. Yeah. It's funny. Um, one of the subjects I teach at the Pennsylvania Academy is a, a seminar course called Creativity and Inspiration. And one of the um, modules of the course is a week where we discuss roadblocks and inhibition. And so I did sort of some anecdotal informal research. And what I have uh, come to understand is that nine times out of 10, when an artist doesn't like their work, it's for really weird reasons. Like they didn't sleep the night before. Mm -hmm. Someone they love didn't like it or didn't say the right thing in front of it. Um, or there are more sophisticated reasons. Like it didn't open up avenues of uh, brand new inspiration. So they hold that against the individual piece, which is right. when you think about it, kind of absurd, but a very human thing to do. Um, also, I think that as artists, we always think maybe we're going to have fun this time. I, uh, the relationship of making art to having fun, you know, there's a topic. I, uh, I think people, people who aren't artists maybe have uh, imagined that artists are having fun all the time. And there are <laughs> artists that I have met who talk about their studio as though it's a, a sanctuary. Yeah. And, um, however, that has not been my personal experience. It's always a fight. And I don't know who's going to win this fight. And maybe it's me, maybe it's the piece. But it's really challenging. And so sometimes my feelings can be really negative. Um, some, I post on Instagram, pieces in progress, uh, occasionally. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times I post on Instagram because I'm not feeling confident at all. And I just want to know if anyone likes it because it's, um, you know, a very uncomfortable feeling. <clears throat> I think that, that I really relate to um, what you're saying about how hard it is um, because I feel like, and I've said this before to my husband, um, the only difference between somebody who, who is able to publish, um, to get published writing and who, who doesn't is just pure like slogging having having the the willingness to like work through all like those many moments where you just don't want to do it anymore where it just becomes so hard and there are so many sort of um, barriers to getting to where you, to expressing what it is you want to say um, and it's just it's just kind of continuing and and pushing through and not giving up so it's it's really often not, there's like those very brief moments of, of delight and excitement when you, when you say the right thing or you phrase it correctly or you figure out the right you know, thing to say um, compared to the percentage of time where you're just slogging through. Well, I even kind of like the slogging parts. It's like, it's like the fighting parts I'm a little less keen on. <laughs> you know, one of the questions I get all the time is, um, where do you get your inspiration? Which is, or questions relating to inspiration. And one of the things that strikes me as um, interesting about that question is usually artists um, will give you a list of stuff they find inspiring, which is uh, a reasonable approach to that question. But I also think it's funny because there's a presumption that inspiration is the first step before you do anything. And uh, um, for me, I think I would rather be inspired later in the uh, process rather than at the beginning of the process. Mm. So I try to um, create a situation where I'm not inspired by uh, something and then that it's like you shed it like a, a snake skin. Mm -hmm. It's something that I, I'm trying to develop and build as I'm working. I'd like to inspiration to happen very last. <clears throat> right. Um, okay. I, I think that you kind of, you mentioned that you teach and um, I feel like this is something that uh, really informs your relationship to a creative life, right? Living and um, engaging with students on a regular basis. Um, and I, I'm interested to hear what your thoughts are on sort of You've been teaching now for, for decades, right? So what, 
what is your view on and and clearly your influence has has been on on you know many years of students what what is your perception what are your thoughts about the sort of next generation of artists or what do you see coming down the road it's going to be a bummer if we have to teach it on zoom forever yeah teaching stained glass on zoom is going to be awful yeah. <laughs> if i have to do it i don't even know how how i would pull that one off it would end up uh becoming a liberal arts class and uh you know Art has had this problem of uh, sort of migrating itself into the liberal arts for a while now. One of the uh, um, things people used to sort of like to toss around in discussions was the relationship of art to craft, but I, I think maybe a more um, relevant conversation for now is what's going to happen to skill. Of course, skill has been a big deal in academia while well, getting tossed out of academia circa 1950, 1970. When did it get kicked out? Many, many times. In stages, it's gotten kicked out. Um, and I think that that conversation might be important to have in the future, or maybe we won't be having it at all. I don't know. I love to teach. I didn't, I didn't want to teach at first. Mm -hmm. I wanted the money. Um, <laughs> but... <laughs> but I came to understand that I truly loved teaching. And um, all the cliches are true. I mean, it keeps you fresh. Uh, mm. Much as, uh, I, before the pandemic, I used to say things like, a perfect day for me is a day where I don't unlock the front door. Now, first of all, I feel like my keys are a hot zone and I'm afraid to unlock the front door. <laughs> I do go out, but um, so, um, I had a fantasy that I was going to be a real lone individual hermit artist. And I do love solitude. Solitude mm. is not the same thing as isolation. Right. Two different things. Don't yeah. confuse them. Um, <clears throat> and so teaching was a way of getting out of my own head, let alone my house and studio. It was, it's really um, a way of seeing glass if i'm teaching glass in a whole new way or any anything any topic at hand in a entirely fresh new way mm. um we have another question from the audience uh what was the name of your punk band that you fronted and how does how did those aesthetics find their way into your practice oh that's really easy to answer i never fronted a punk band so there are none However, I was in the background of several. <laughs> um, I, I don't even want to tell you the name of the first band. <laughs> it, was, it was a really interesting band, artistically speaking, um, with um, my friend Brian Willette, who is the um, studio manager at um, Byers Stained Glass in Philadelphia and helps me with my larger pieces uh, mm -hmm. and installation and stuff like that. Right. Um, that band ultimately got called Icebox, but we had like 10 other names. And we only played like, I don't know, five or six shows. And then I joined a band called Ken. And then it was called Ken because it was a concept. That it was going to be an all-girl band with a guy singer, and we were going to refer to him as Ken. And that band still exists. I, they still play. I am not in it. I was in it for a long time. Uh, and uh, it was a, a, an outstanding experience. I loved it. I, um, <clears throat> it was funny because... I think because I had my own studio thing going on with stained glass and with art, I did not feel any need to have creative control in that band. Mm -hmm. And so I did write some of the songs and, but mostly I just like performing on stage. I didn't know I was such a ham. Uh, you know, I practiced rock poses in front of the mirror. Okay, so part of the question is how did those aesthetics find their way into my practice? Actually, it's the other way around. When I went to, I graduated with a bachelor's degree. I do not have a master's. I graduated with my bachelor's in 1983. And the East Village punk rock scene was going strong. I'm actually a little too young to be a proper punk mm. rocker. 
And I was gonna move to Alphabet City and show in one of those galleries with my punky art, because I was already kind of making art to that aesthetic, which I, the moment I saw it, I felt a great affinity with the East Village artists and um, wanted to be part of that. And I thought it was gonna be real easy. <laughs> mm. <laughs> anyway, so that came first. And uh, I, didn't, I didn't end up moving to New York. I don't know if that's obvious or not, but this is Philadelphia. Philadelphia, <clears throat> yes. And you've been in Philadelphia since? 1983, when? I graduated and I moved here. Wow. Um, so there was uh, some terminology that you used when you were describing, um, I think it was one of your later pieces, your, your um, beached whale, which is um, towards the end of the exhibition at MAG. Um, and I'm gonna continue to scroll through the work here, but I'm just gonna ask you to talk about, um, you described it as one of your environmental collapse screeds when you were describing um, beach whale. And so I'm, I'm interested to hear you talk about your thoughts about um, the environment and uh, climate change and, and you know, sort of where that falls within your, um, your subject matter right now. Well, it's funny. I, um, I've never thought of myself as being a very political person. I mean, everyone's got a political aspect to their personality. Um, I think um, when Trump was elected, a lot of artists felt like it was a call to, to action, um, as did I. But I was uh, in my late 50s, so it's like rethinking my whole career and my whole approach to art seemed it, it, it was a crisis. Like, what do you do when there is a political crisis yeah. as an artist? Right. Um, do you quit and become an activist? Or do you change your art to make it have political messages? And I always felt that political art had a problem of either preaching to the choir or sort of becoming propaganda pretty quickly. And so... Um, I just let it be in the back of my mind. I've always been probably most uh, concerned about um, climate change and habitat destruction. When I was in seventh grade, I did a social studies report on the ozone. Why did people think the ozone hole was a surprise when it happened later? Yeah. It, I mean, we knew about it for decades. Right. And uh, I drew a very painstaking aerosol can on the uh, cover of my report. Um, so I was always interested in that topic. I love animals. And so my work has sort of gradually migrated away from being people to being images. It's almost like the backgrounds are taking over, mm. but there's animal characters now. I think I'm less, less interested in my own melodrama and more interested in, in external things myself. So I started doing images. Um, beached whales are, are a phenomenon, whether it's climate change or not. I mean, there are images of beached whales and uh, that people have contributed to the culture for, for eons, and they're fascinating. They're so big. I wanted to make that piece as big as a real beached whale, but that did not happen. <laughs> wow. What would that have taken? A lot of money. <laughs> a lot of glass. Yeah. Here we have My One Desire from 2007. This piece has been a lot of fun to show to um, the audience because when you turn off the light um, to the light box, that vivid red color um, turns to, it, it looks white because of the way that you've, I think the way that you sandblasted the glass. Um, it's a really dramatic change. I think it does a great job of giving a sense of the layering that's going on. Um, so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the way that you layer the images that you make. I think I have a question for you. Instead. Oh. I'll answer that okay. later, maybe. Um, I am curious to know what your, what, how you feel about um, the role of women as artists. You have a sort of a feminist bent as a curator, and uh, that's obviously been a, a topic in contemporary art 
for the past uh, 30, 40, 50 years. Um, you showed Josephine Tota before me, which was a, a resurrection of a, I didn't know her of her. Um, glad to hear of her. Yeah. And, uh, and then me. So uh, could you speak a little about that? Oh, gosh. I, I would have sort of endless things to say about it. I mean, I, I think that um, as a curator, I don't, I don't assume the audience's interest in, um, in any subject that I'm interested in. But, but what I always hope that I can do is um, help convey that enthusiasm that I have for a work or, um, or maybe resurrect the, the, those early moments of excitement that, that I have felt about a subject. Um, and I think right now, uh, one of the things that's actually very painful um, for having the museum closed is that in my opinion, we, we look um, as good as we have ever looked um, as a museum. Um, with your exhibition in the, in the Docent Gallery, we've got um, a portfolio of prints by Chitra Ganesh, um, another um, young woman who was working out of Brooklyn. It's a fabulous portfolio of prints called Sul Sultana's Dream. Uh, that, that too is available to be viewed as a, a digital exhibition on our website. And we're showing a work in our media arts gallery by Jatavia Gary um, called Giverny One. And, uh, and so I, I'm really, I was thrilled to have um, three of our exhibition spaces occupied by women artists right now and, um, and exciting artists and living artists and people who are doing um, really innovative and, and interesting things and, and, and in such a variety of ways. Um, so, so that was painful. And, and I just, you know, I, I think that um, it's always surprising to me, actually, when I was in the early stages of trying to find partner museums for this exhibition for Judith Schechter, I was at a curator's conference in, um, I think it was in New York, and I was speaking with a curator who uh, worked in a Canadian institution a big Canadian institution. And I remember her saying, oh yeah, this is great. We really, um, you know, it's so great that you're doing work by a, a woman artist. Um, we need to do more of that at our institution. And it, it, you know, basically the way that she was talking about it and no, you know, disrespect for her, but almost like it was being innovative to show a, a, a woman artist, um, which seemed crazy to me, you know, <laughs> let that, that that would be a perspective that it's still viewed as something. Women can make art. Yeah, wow. really something surprising <laughs> that museums are, are, wow, that's great that you're doing that. Um, that, that seems, that's still an unexpected perfect, uh, perspective for me to see. So, so I, I don't really, um, I don't think I have any wisdom to express about how I see women, women artists, um, it, right now and into the future, only that I that those are the artists that interest me. That's you know I'm I guess um, from a personal perspective I'm I'm the youngest of four daughters, so my world has always been a female world, um, and those are the subjects and the topics that I find most compelling. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what I want to see. Those are the voices that I want to hear. I've actually gotten to the place too where when I'm reading fiction I I for the most part I'm mostly like if I see a book that looks interesting by a male author, I'm actually reading a male author right now, but I'm kind of consciously choosing not to, um, to read books by male authors um, for the most part, really seeking out female voices because I feel like, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've done my fair share of reading male authors. Not that they don't have wonderful things to contribute. They certainly, they certainly do, but um, it's just a conscious choice on my part right now. Um, I thank you for for asking me that question, Judith. Um, we do have another question from the aud audience. Is there another retrospective planned for the Philadelphia area? Not to my knowledge, Philly. <laughs> I, yeah, Philly. I can say that um, that this exhibition will be traveling to the Toledo Museum of Art next, um, and it should be there through the fall. Um, and into the winter. And then the next venue after that is the uh, Des Moines Art Center. So I think that's really exciting. You know, one thing we could talk about, or apropos of this question, Philadelphia is having to cut its city budget and they're cutting their culture office out of existence, which is terrible. Philadelphia has a long, wonderful cultural history. It's not a rich city, so its budget is probably really tight. And um, 
I, I wonder how the pandemic is going to affect the art world, not just um, the mar art market, like yeah. what will happen to galleries. I mean, we all saw what happened to galleries from Hurricane Sandy, and that only lasted a day. Um, and uh, but the, from the art, the art market to how artists respond to it as individuals to curating in museums and will will the role of the museum change i agree that probably it's easier to keep people um uh people go into museums and they're uh, on their best behavior so i think they, <laughs> that they might stay further away from each other because they think of museums as a place to be polite is that true i think so i, I mean i think that um i think museums are going to be sort of um at the forefront of, of figuring out ways to um, to open the world back up again, you know, basically what is the safe way for people to be back out in public and to engage with with other people at a distance and, and also experience things outside of their their little home or apartment or wherever they are. Um, I know that we're thinking a lot about it at MAG and um, and, uh, and and at a conference that I recently was at with other curators, there was a lot of discussion about, you know, um, the scale of uh, exhibitions changing could that be a, a path forward where you know something like the the major major um, international exhibitions that have you know dozens and dozens of loans and um, are meant to bring in massive crowds of people is that something that we can the museums can continue to support do we have to be thinking differently about uh, you know whether or not exhibitions are prioritized in the same way are there opportunities for permanent collections to be viewed in a more sort of creative and, and uh, playful and experimental way. Um, I think that there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, innovation that'll come from this. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it, nothing in museums happens quickly. <laughs> we move slowly. I think it's just, you know, it's just dealing with art and being really um, responsible caretakers of art and really um, feeling always the responsibility of, of being the stewards um, of, of this artistic legacy makes us move more slowly maybe than, than we would otherwise. Um, but yeah, it's, it's well, absolutely- I feel like a lot of artists are gonna really suffer. Like they have to have usually outside jobs to support their creative um, endeavors and uh, probably they're unemployed now. So will they even be able to make art? That would, I mean, I don't, I get sort of fed up with the romantic notion that artists are so passionate that they're gonna make art even when they're starving and, and uh, living on the streets. You know, stop it. Stop being so mean to the artists. Um, <laughs> um, that's, I don't think the case. Um, <clears throat> and of course, in the United States, we pretty much depend on philanthropy and nonprofits to fund the arts. So uh, right. I guess we'll see. Yes. It's scary. Yeah. Yes, people will never stop making art. That's true. But that doesn't mean that you get to suck it up for free, um, people. Right. <laughs> yeah, it'll be interesting to see over the course of the next couple of years what that long-term impact really is. Um, let's see, are there any other questions from our audience? I know that we're coming up um, very soon to the uh, Battle of Carnival in Lent um, piece. And so I know that this is a, a work that is in Mag's collection. Um, we're very proud to have um, this great work by Judith Schechter in our exhibition. Here it is, the Battle of Carnival in Lent. Um, and I was hoping that you could maybe reflect a little bit on on when this piece was made and what um what your memory is of of having made it and the project and really what the impact of a project on this scale had on your your career overall well the story of making this piece is is pretty funny because i i wasn't going to make it i um I forget what year Eastern State Penitentiary opened as a tourist site. Um, it was a, the first panopticon prison ever. 
and it functioned as a prison until the 1970s. Since it looks really ancient and like a ruin, that sometimes really surprises people. There are still people alive today that were incarcerated there. Right. So it, but it's a ruin. It looks like a ruin. It looks like something that's hundreds of thousands of years old. The paint's all peeling, stuff's uh, all falling apart. So when it first opened, they allowed people to come in and wear hard hats and tour the site. And I saw the prison then and I knew immediately that I wanted to install stained glass windows in those prison cells. Now, the idea was for the prisoners, even though they weren't there anymore. But um, so years later, they have now currently an artist in residence program where you can do a proposal. So I did a proposal and it was accepted. And I was going to make 10 small windows for 10 cells. But when I was touring the site to look at locations, the director, uh, Sean Kelly, suggested that I make a window for the transom, there it is, uh, in cell block 11, I think it is. And that, it doesn't look big, does it? Well, it's enormous. And I, um, he said, you should make a piece for that. And I said, oh my goodness, you're out of your mind. Uh, it would take forever. And it would be like the biggest thing I ever made and no. And he said, well, I think it would be your masterpiece. And I thought, oh. anyway, that got to me. So I made, uh, I made the piece. It was almost like I couldn't not make the piece. And it was initially based on Peter Bruegel's painting, The Battle of Carnival and Lent, which is, I guess, a historical, like Mardi Gras kind of celebration right before Lent. And it represents sort of a battle between excess and indulgence and austerity. And I thought, well, you know, it's the old angel on one shoulder, devil on the other, battling it out for the control of the person's soul. And, um, so I will do a prison riot that is the seven cardinal virtues battling. There are. Do you even know them? I mean, does anyone know them? Yeah. <laughs> uh, versus the seven deadly sins, which get all the play in the media. Right. Now, when I designed this, I quickly came to the conclusion that I don't really believe in um, good versus evil in quite such a black and white way. So it just became a big battle of crazy characters. Mm. Um, there is an angel and a devil at the top. Um, I had to make the piece in, like, I set a land speed record for stained glass art. Um, I think I made it in five months or something like that. It was really fast, but it, that was my pandemic practice. I didn't leave the house. I had, you know, people sliding matzah and pizza under the front door crack. And uh, I didn't socialize. <laughs> it really did change my life because after that, I kind of stuck with that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but it was an exciting piece to work on. I really felt like I was on the edge of disaster every second of every day. That was fun. Yeah, I I um I love to tell the story when we when Mag acquired this piece. Part of the process of of acquiring a work of art, buying something, um, is that the curator needs to write a justification and and do all the research and 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 make a good case for why it's an important addition to the collection. Um, and then that's presented to the art committee, and the art committee um does the final vote on whether or not to acquire it. So in addition to writing up the proposal and the justification, um, I created a, a slideshow with images and sort of giving everybody the context for your career and, and where this fits within your career and, and why I thought it would be a, a strong addition to the collection. And, um, and when I was done with my presentation, the art committee started to clap. And that was, I, I had not ever experienced that before. And I, to me, it was just one of those moments where I felt like that was the start and, and the early understanding for the reception that, that not only this work, but that, that you would get at MAG, um, both our stakeholders, our board, our, our audience, our docents, um, our audiences, you know, it, it, general public. It, it was, really the start for me um, and that early indicator that that this was a good fit. Um, so we're thrilled to have it. We've used it in multiple locations in our permanent collection gallery. It's, it's a wonderful piece for us and it's definitely a visitor favorite. 
Um, but oh. I did want to point, I wanted to point out something that you um, mentioned to me early on that these, about these um, figures and their, their masks. Would you, would you describe what those are? Well, they're a bird mask, but they're sort of intended to be um, somewhat reminiscent of a plague doctor. But I did not foresee this coming. Of course you couldn't have, <laughs> but I was just thinking about that the other day because these, these sort of, this figure here, this figure. I think there's seven of them all together. It's a little guy I'm, over I'm here. I'm pointing at one right now. Yeah, I think there's a little one over here. Yeah. Um, and so those were masks that doctors would wear during the plague. Um, and in those beaks would be sort of, I think, herbs and other sort of things to um, protect them from not only the odors, but also what they thought were the, the sort of dangers of the plague. Miasma. Miasma. They thought it was miasma, right. which was a step up from evil spirits and yes. a step closer to germs. Yes. God only knows what will supersede germs and viruses. Right. Hopefully something that is easier to deal with. <clears throat> yeah. Um, I think every artist dreams of uh, people loving their work, whether they are willing to admit that <laughs> publicly or not. Um, some people are more compelled to make that a reality than others, but I'm thrilled that the piece is at MAG. I'm thrilled that people like it. I, um, I often hear as an art teacher students say like, well, uh, it doesn't matter if anyone likes it, I make it for myself because that makes you sound like you're not a big sellout <laughs> and um, that you don't have cheap commercial interests. But I really do hope that people respond to the work. Not everybody, I understand not everyone's gonna like it, but, uh, but I'm glad that it has found an audience. It means everything to me. And I, um, I've come to understand that I have something in my eye. I have come to <laughs> understand that I, I do want my art to be uplifting, even mm. if it appears to be not uplifting, because I, I, want to do, I want it to do something for people. I don't want it to, you know, just sit there and make people feel crappy. Right. That's no good. Right. Mm -hmm. Some kind of a response is, is important. Yeah. Let's see. I think that we may be nearing um, the end of our hour slot, actually. I think that we're very close to the end. And I wonder if there's any more um, audience questions or, Judith, if you had any other thoughts that you wanted to share or any other questions? I think, I think we've covered it. I think I'm we have good. covered it. It's really I'm nice just, to talk to you, Jess. It was great to talk to you, Judith. And I'm just going to make sure that I get to scroll through the very to the very last work in the exhibition because none of them should be missed. Here is um, immigration policy. And the next one is beached whale. The right? The next one is the florist. Oh, the florist. And then we have beached whale. So I welcome our audience to um, visit the online exhibition. I uh, certainly welcome them back to the MAG when we, when we are able to open up um, to come see the show before it leaves in September. And um, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Judith, very much. And thank for you, and thank, thanks to everyone who um, attended or is watching later. I know we had some video problems. Uh, thank you for your patience. Um, I know how frustrating that can be, um, but we really appreciate your time. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Bye.